All right, guys, welcome back to the second part of unit number four. In this uh, edition of the lecture, we're going to be talking about um, the different empires that were able to expand off of the ones we talked about last time. But um, where we're going to start today is talking about part number two um, right here. So we left off talking about the Portuguese and the causes for exploration. Today, what we are going to do um, is we are going to kind of go a little bit deeper with each of those right there. So let's get started. All right. So the first thing I want you guys to think about um, right here is this idea of how do you think these initial steps by the Portuguese? So all the things that the Portuguese did in the beginning, which was to explore the coast of Africa, to start to build up these colonies, to have these trade post empires. How do you think those initial steps of of what they eventually did with the exploring in the beginning of the 14, the 1500s, late 1400s, would become even more and more important, more and more significant when the new world is being discovered. Because remember, when the Portuguese first started to explore the coast of Africa, they did not discover the new world. It wasn't until um, a little bit later with Christopher Columbus. So how do you think what the Portuguese did in the beginning really, really is going to be super important and influence that as well? So go ahead and answer the question, pause the video and answer that one right now. All right. So talking about the Portuguese, the other thing that's very, very important is that they set up these trade post empires. Um, as you guys can see, these trade post empires are going to be very, very significant. Um, you've got all these different ones that are created. And what's important to notice about this graph right here is take a look at the dates. Um, a lot of these ones like Mozambique, Mombasa, Gao, all these different ones are going to be established by the Portuguese themselves, 1510, 1502, 1511, all these different places that are going to, Bombay, um, Mo Mombasa, Mozambique, that are going to become capitals and major cities are going to have a huge influence and they're actually going to be created by the Portuguese at this time. So that's going to be very, very significant right there. Also, you should see some overlap right here, some overlap between where the Portuguese set up their trade posts and the old Indian Ocean trade. Because at the time, the Indian Ocean trade was not at all militarized. There was no one really fighting. There were no naval battles between the Persians or the Muslims or the Chinese traders. Everyone had was just had this mutual understanding that we're all going to benefit from trade. Well, because of that, they didn't build big ships. And they did, definitely didn't put cannons on those ships. So when the Portuguese arrived, they said, oh, whoa, hold on. We could totally take these things over with our new ships that we've made, these Caracs and these Carabels and all these different things right here. So um, that's going to be very, very significant. And there's some overlap in there. Also, we talked about the Portuguese and making their travels. Bartolomeu Diaz eventually is going to get around the Cape of Good Hope, get to the bottom to show that, hey, there is a way to get around Africa and get to the Indian Ocean. Vasco da Gama is going to eventually make it all the way to India. He's actually going to get help from a Muslim trader um, to find out where the different ocean tides are and the monsoon winds are actually going to be uh, knowledge that that he is sh gets uh, shared with from that trader as well and so eventually he's going to travel back with a, a whole boat full of spices and all these different goods that are, are going to very much entice the rest of the portuguese to travel and get to the indian ocean so that's really their focus is getting to the indian ocean right there all right so we're going to talk about some explorers today but believe it or not um, the first person to circumnavigate the globe was not Magellan. It was Enrique of Malacca, who is someone that's not necessarily in the AP curriculum, but it's very, very important. He eventually um, was captured by Magellan when uh, Magellan was ta uh, attacking Malacca or Malaysia. Um, however, they dropped him off in Cebu in the Philippines. So uh, Magellan got to the Philippines and led to this. Magellan, a Portuguese skipper, the girls found him cute. He sailed with five ships to find the East Indies, then come back to Spain with a bounty of loot. Whoopie tie, yay, oh, oh, happy Magellan, starting your journey with hardly a care. Whoopie tie, yay, oh, strong brave Magellan, you'll find the East Indies, you just don't know where. Atlantic 
So think about, um, for this one, according to the Animaniacs, awesome right there, what was Magellan, or why was Magellan's voyage considered unsuccessful? So what were the reasons why it was considered unsuccessful? All right, so let's pick up where we left off. So after Magellan's death, Elcano um, took command of the Karak the Victoria, which was the ship they were on, dropped off Enrique, who they blamed for tipping off the, the whole death of Magellan, um, and Elcano uh, then returned to Spain, completing the voyage. So his ship did make it across, but he himself, unfortunately, did not. So taking a look at some of these maritime empires that were existing at this time, we've got the Portuguese, which we've talked about already. We've got the Spanish that are going to be one of the most significant ones to consider. You've got the Dutch that are going to probably be the most powerful and the richest by the end of this whole, or the richest at least by the end of this. And then last but not least, you've got the British um, right here, who's going to have a major, major role um, in this idea of, um, uh, being so powerful. The British are going to come out of this as the most powerful. The Dutch are become the richest. The Spanish were looking pretty good. The Portuguese started it. And then, then you've got the French. But we're not going to talk much about the French. All right. So taking a look at here, there's a very, very insignificant line that you need to know about. And this line right here is the Treaty of Tordesillas. The Treaty of Tordesillas um, was um, basically a way for to separate the two sides. So when Columbus first stopped in Portugal on his return, the king said all the land that you have been to Columbus belong to Portugal. Um, because based on this old treaty that gave land south of Portugal actually to Portugal. So they technically were south. If you'll notice that Europe is up here, is Portugal and Spain are up here, so they are south. So Pope Alec, or the Spanish are like, uh, heck no, we're not giving all this land up to you. There's no way we're going to be neighbors and also sharing and fighting over all this stuff in the new world. And so they asked for someone to negotiate this treaty. Well, who better to do that than a guy with a big hat? They asked the Pope. So the Pope negotiates this treaty, Pope Alexander VI, and he decides anything on left or anything west of this line is going to belong to Spain. And obviously at the time, they didn't really know what was west and anything right will belong to Portugal, which makes a lot of sense because the Portuguese themselves, they had gotten hold of Africa. So both sides were pretty happy about this right here. 
Um, this laid the terms for the new world. However, the Pope it doesn't have an army, at least not one that's back from the Crusades yet. So it's not going to be enforced. And so the whole point of the Treaty of Tordesillas, the whole point of this was to try to figure out a way that they were not going to have conflict between the two sides, between Portugal and Spain, and, and really just Europe in general in this new world, because there's been so much war that's been happening um, in and there's been so much war happening in uh, the old world that the new world was just going to be a whole nother place for conflict. And they were like, well, let's try to avoid that right there. So eventually what's going to happen is the rise of the Spanish Empire. So if you're looking at the Treaty of Tordesillas, yeah, they did pretty well right here. And this is going to have a major, major influence. And obviously what they didn't know um, and that they didn't know is that this was going to have a huge influence as well on some of the old kingdoms that were there. All right, so enough background, um, because Spain is important for one reason and one reason only. The empire, which they're going to call um, New Spain is going to be the, the phrase. I mean, really creative names right there. And you'll notice there are a bunch of different explorers. You've got Columbus, obviously. Um, you've got the discovery of Brazil. You've got the discovery of Bermuda. Cortez, who gets into the interior of Mexico before conquering the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. You've got um, De Leon, who discovers uh, Florida, who was eventually looking for the Ponce de Leon, um, didn't find the the fountain of youth right there. Pizarro, who is eventually going to take and suppress the Incas. Uh, De Soto gets all the way up into the Americas, the Appalachian Mountains, like Tennessee. Um, and eventually you're going to have Coronado, who gets all the way to the Grand Canyon. And so the new world, overwhelmingly, is discovered by the Spanish. They were the first empire to be described. El Imperio en el que nunca se une el sol. Great Spanish right there. The sun never sets on the Spanish Empire. Eventually, the British are going to steal that phrase right there and says, hey, that's a really nice phrase. Maybe we'll use that. So that's going to be um, them right there. All right. So, oops. So meanwhile, Columbus. Columbus is the very, very famous one. I mean, obviously, you guys already know about Columbus right here. He's a very significant explorer. Um, and eventually... The, he decides he wants to reach the West Asian markets, just kind of like Magellan did. The king of Portugal says, uh, no, we've got enough. I've already given my fourth son all of our money to set up these trade schools. We don't want you. Uh, you you're, you're Italian. Actually, he was um, from Genoa, which is kind of – it wasn't Italy when it wasn't yet a country yet. But the Spanish king and queen, who are trying to keep up, catch up to the Portuguese, decide that they are going to sponsor his village. They give him some money, uh, and with a fleet of three ships, he lands in San Salvador, which he's going to call Hispaniola in the Bahamas. Took him three months to get there, which was quite a while. Get off track a little bit. Um, he realizes that immediately he's going to return to Spain without the things that he thought, without gold, spices, and silk. But he told everyone... I got to Asia. I got to the Indies, which is why um, he called them the West Indies. News quickly spread and new explorers followed rapidly. And that's really Columbus's biggest influence. It's not that he himself did anything great. Actually, he did a lot of things not so great. But he sparked a, a massive, massive movement of exploration. And, and everyone kind of was like, oh, if Columbus can do it, I can do it. So... He makes a lot of different voyages, four voyages back and forth between in about a period of 10 years. And you'll notice um, that he, he really doesn't go off his uh, major path right here. It's, it's basically to Cuba, Jamaica. He goes a little bit to the northern part of South America. Doesn't really um, get to Central America too much, a little bit. But he really, he's, he's traveling between the Caribbean and um, Portugal. All right. So... Let's take a look at the guy who discovered America right here, all right, and the thought he discovered Asia. So um, let's take a look. As you guys think about this, I want you to think about three ways um, that the perception, the elementary school perception of Columbus is challenged in this video.
celebrate today. All right. So, pretty interesting. So, three things um, that ways that Columbus you didn't know about that might have been ruined or his legacy, his elementary school legacy. All right. So, in elementary school, you probably learned about Columbus um, from a very, very young age, or at least many children learned about a young age. And then you get to high school, and we do not uh, uh, step away from the truth right here. All right. So we talked about these two empires already, the Aztec and the Incas. And I want you to talk, we're going to look now on their fall. Um, I want you to look at some similarities and their difference. Um, so first off, we've got the Aztec Empire. Um, the Aztec Empire meet um, the explorer um, Hernan Cortez. And in 30 months, in less than three years, this gigantic empire with the largest city um, in the world will be completely gone. In 1517, um, they are they arrive. Um, but it was in, thir in less than three years, the Aztecs are gone. The Maya uh, resist for another 150 years, which is why so many um, indigenous tribes in Central America speak Mayan, because they were able to hold on. Um, the governor of Cuba sent Cortez with 100 soldiers, five sailors, 530 soldiers, and 112 riflemen. Cortez then met up with the Spaniards and other Native American tribes um, because a lot of these obviously Native, Indigenous, Central American tribes did not like the Aztecs very much. Hey, hey, flower wars. Now it's our time for payback. He meets up with Montezuma and is welcomed as the sun god. He then decides, all right, well, I'm going to kill the emperor. He kills Montezuma. In three years, the capital of Tenochtitlan or the, the city state of Tenochtitlan falls. And then in Mesoamerica, 60 years later, the Aztec Empire is completely, completely vanished. On the other side, you've got the Inca Empire. The Inca Empire, same, you got a Spanish explorer named Pizarro. He arrives, though, in the middle of a civil war. There's actually some uh, evidence that the middle of and the Aztecs had major droughts or possibly diseases that were happening um, at the time. They had a major upswing in the number of human sacrifices before the Aztecs arrived. Um, and he is also seen as um, kind of like a re envision of the famous, famous Inca god Atahualpa. Um, Unfortunately, Pizarro's father and legitimate heir had died of smallpox of the actual Atahualpa. The Inca emperor had already died. Um, so Atahualpa found out that he won the war. And then literally later that next day, Pizarro arrives. So he just won a civil war. And now he finds out that Pizarro is there. Um, initially, just like the, Inca, the Aztecs, the Inca Pizarro thought that um, this guy... They, initially, they, he was thought that he was a god. Um, but then he started to eat and get dressed, and they're like, uh, no, this isn't no god. Pizarro had 168 men, 62 horses. Um, the Atualapa served them corn beer, um, and eventually the priest offered them a Bible in hopes of converting them to Christianity. His army was still away at battle, and so the Pizarro took advantage of this, captured the emperor, said, listen, fill this entire room with gold and I will release him, lied, never released him, killed the emperor and took control of a lot of the Inca capital right there. So some similarities, some differences. What do you notice about the fall of these two once mighty great empires? So now that the Spanish in charge, what they got to figure out is who is going to work for them. So they decide to set up an entire system. And this system in Spain is called the Encomienda system. And over here is kind of how you have it set up. And the most important thing that they would do is they would build a church, oftentimes on top of the remains of Aztec temples. They'd build a church almost first and a fort because they wanted to show the military power and the power of the church. They would then build these giant blocks of native houses. They would put a Spaniard in control. They would oftentimes link him to a monk or a priest. And they would start farming on a massive, massive scale. And so they would use this system, this forced labor system, to basically completely take control of the native population right here. All right. And the question then is, 
this was horrible. It was it was miserable. People were dying all the time. It was a, it was basically almost it was a slave system. And so, is anyone going to stand up for these people that had been completely completely taken advantage of? Enter Bartolome de las Casas. Bartolome de las Casas is going to be a very, very important and very, very famous figure. You probably will see a source by him um, on the AP test. And he's a Spanish Catholic who migrated into this area in, in 1502. And he was the first one to be given the title, the protector of the Indians. The King Charles V actually appointed him to speak on behalf of the natives in court and report to the king. He actually was part of an inconvenient system. He gave it up himself and he freed his Indian slaves and he told the king that he did that. Um, but hold on here. He decides, hey, we should get African slaves instead. So he's not totally going to be uh, a, a total hero. And then later he saw, he says, well, no, that's also wrong too. Surprise, surprise. All forms of slavery are evil. He's going to return to Spain and he's going to write extensively. He's going to write, he's going to draw, he's going to paint all of these things to advocate for the people. Um, in 1550, there's a great debate and there's a courtroom trial how to actually determine how the government and how the, the Spanish people should treat the native people, the Native Americans that live there. Uh, he is obviously going to defend the natives and he. this is going to lead to new laws that are going to make it you know, not that everyone's going to be freed, but there's going to be a lot of restrictions on the encomienda system right here, determining um, rights and rules and laws and things like that. Um, and then eventually this is going to end native slavery. So uh, he writes a short account um, called The Destruction of the Indies. Obviously, just by reading the title there, you can tell what the point of view is. Um, very, very famous book right here. And he starts to actually describe and write a primary source of what is happening, the atrocities that the Spanish are committing against the Native Americans. And it's also one of the earliest sources that we have to show how the diseases brought by the Europeans completely decimated the Native population. He sends it to the king, um, and then eventually his descriptions are later engraved into some painting in the 1580s. And so you can see these. this is what people have drawn and painted based on what he has described he saw. So just some horrible, horrible scenes um, right here that are really, really, I mean, these are true. These really happened. It was an absolute genocide um, at the hands of the Spanish in particular. So just some awful, awful things. So I want to mention specifically um, what what these systems of labor are because a coerced labor is a system where the workers were forced to work based on threats, pressure, or contractual obligations. So for example, what would fit under this? Serfdom would fit under this, right? Oftentimes this was, you, you, you didn't have a choice. This was either serfdom or death, um, especially in the manor system. We talked about them. We talked about here also the Mita system that the Inca used. Right. Eventually, um, the Spanish are going to use the Mita system to kind of coerce and can, and trick the Inca into working for them. But I mean, it, the Mita was about building an empire, not the Spanish empire. Um, it's going to eventually end with the Spanish. And then next, you've also got indentured servitude. Um, this was the idea that if you were to be um, paid, so for example, like I will sponsor your trip to travel to the Americas from Germany or England or Ireland or whatever, and you're going to have to pay a certain number of your wages or you're going to have to work for me unpaid for a certain amount of time. This was actually two thirds of Americans who came to the new world in that 130 year period before the Revolutionary War came as indentured servants um, right here. And then you've got the encomienda system, which is guaranteed by the king, the purpose of trying to culturally convert, religiously convert the natives to Christianity and, and teach them Spanish. And then you've got what we consider a chateau slavery where people are physically property. And this system, began in 1418 and ends in 1888 and 12 million people are going to be transported in this um in this time period right here and when we we think of traditional slavery this is a chattel slavery or chattel slavery is kind of what we think of but there are 
many different examples of different types of what we consider in AP world coerced labor right here. So not to confuse Bartolomeu de la Casa um, with Costas. This is a very thing. A lot of people get this. Costas is one person we're going to talk about now. Casas was the priest. Casas, priest, Costas, painter. All right. Um, so Costas, basically what he decides to do is he says, listen, we're in the new world and we're going to be in the new world for the next 200 years. So what we need to figure out is how we're going to classify people based on a system of race. And this is huge because slavery has existed hierarchy systems have existed, but this is really the first time in human history that we begin to classify people and how they are treated specifically based on race. And it starts in Latin America. So let's take a look at how he did this. At the top are the peninsulares. The peninsulares are people born in the Iberian Peninsula who are born in Europe. And these are going to be the high, high offices, your governors, um, your highest priests. It's 0.1% of the population, a tiny, tiny percent of the population of the New World. Second, you've got the Creoles. And the Creoles are Europeans. Their, their parents were Spanish. Their parents... Um, their mom and dad both were Spanish, but they were physically born in Latin America. So if you were born in Europe, you were the Peninsulares and you, and you came to Spain. If you were born in the New World, you were a Creole and you accounted for about a quarter of the population right here. Next were the Mestizos. And the Mestizos are, are children who are mixed. So they're half native and half European um, right here. So they do have a, a, a European blood in them. And then at the bottom, you have the mulattoes. And the mulattoes are born in African, um, are born in Latin America, but they're born to parents of Europeans and Africans. So there's a class distinction here. If you were born um, of an African slave versus um, a um, Central American worker or a Central American slave, a Native American slave. So there's a difference there in terms of class system. It's going to be very important. So let's take a look here. This is his system that he has, the system that he has right here, the Costas painting, a very, very famous painting that he created. And he's got his role. So up here, um, we've got uh, the Mestizos. We've got all these different groups. And then he even divides it up even smaller than that. So it gets extremely, it's like 23 different classifications. This isn't even, even all of them um, for race. So um, what we are going to do is you guys are going to name that cast. Uh, get it? Cast? Social cast? That, that took a while. Name that casta. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of a mother and a father born in Latin America. And you are going to take a look at your notes and tell me what that child is going to be. So let's take a look at number one. So if I got a peninsulare mother and a peninsulare father, that child is going to be what? So write that one for number one. All right, number two. If I've got a Creole mother and a Creole father, that child is going to be what? If I've got a Creole mother and an African father, what is that child going to be? And lastly, if I've got a Creole mother and a Native American father, what is that child going to be? So write your answers on to those one, two, and three right there. And, oh, sorry, last one. Um, the mother is a peninsulare and the father is African. This is a tough one. So go back, take a look at your notes, see what would happen here if the mother uh, was a peninsulare and the father was African. All right, so eventually all this new contact between the people led Spain to come up with some laws. And they have two different laws. They've got the Republic de Indios and the Republic de Espanols. So on one side, you've got the Republic de Indios who are overseen by religious people. So these are communities where the actual leader is a priest um, a, or a royal representative and their Native American communities for the most part. On the other side, you've got Spaniards and their African slaves. And so now you've got two different communities of people. Obviously, the Spaniards are at the top of this system, but they're going to have different laws based on who lives in them. 
So um, based on where you were, you had a different entire legal system because Native Americans were seen as minors and they needed protection of the crown. And, and by minors, I mean literally as children. And we're going to see this again when we get into um, the age of imperialism and this concept of seeing people as less than or not grown up or not enlightened or not mature enough or as an adult state. And they needed to be protected. Um, but that mean that they were and they describe this as the bad example of some Spanish. So if you were being mistreated or murdered or raped or killed, that, that, that was just a bad example of, of some of the Spaniards. Spaniards aren't like that. So let's kind of compare the two right here. Um, taking a look at the, the Spanish versus the Portuguese. So the Portuguese right here are in blue, and they have some major, major trading points. Really, they're known for being in the Indian Ocean. Um, they start to develop and establish their area of Mare Classum, um, or Mare Liberum, which is Latin, um, is their area uh, that they control. Um, they have some major, major city-states, um, uh, and they kind of come up on the coast of Africa, the Middle East, India, and, and they have some areas that they're able to actually um, kind of control. And if they can control these four different areas, they're going to have major control of the Indian Ocean. So they can control the Strait of Hormuz, which is in um, – north um, of the Middle East. You've got the Aid, the Gulf of Aden, which is this area to kind of get between Africa and the Middle East so they can control Middle Eastern trade for the most part. The Mozambique Channel, which is where ships would travel to get to the Indian Ocean. And the Strait of Malacca, which is going to be incredibly important for getting to the Spice Islands. On the other side, you've got the Spanish Mare Classum, um, or the Mar del Sur, um, which is going to be the Pacific Ocean. And all the entire world is controlled and said to be part of the Spanish. And so obviously we've got the, the major cities right here, like Tenochtitlan, and you've got Cusco that they eventually take over. But they say, okay, everything basically west of California, everything in the Pacific Ocean is ours, all right? And eventually that they declare that, uh, and in, in 1790, they, they say, never mind, you can't control that anymore. And so the entire, think about that, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Oceans are completely controlled by two different empires. Yeah, that's not going to last for very long. That's not going to be cool. All right, so that's going to finish us up. Um, for talking about the Portuguese and the Spanish. We're going to talk about the other empires um, that were going on, the British, the French, and the Dutch as well um, that were happening in this time period. But that's going to wrap up our notes for today. I will see you guys next time. Have a great, great day.